Well, oh. Okay, we have to follow the comics. That's always fun. Um, so it's something they just said, actually, that you just said backstage to me. Henry Ford didn't say he was trying to save the world, but he actually did, correct? Of course he did. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. He said that he was making... He was building cars for everybody. Yeah. Cars were expensive. Uh, cars were expensive. Cars were for the rich, and Henry Ford made the Model T right. for, for every man. That was the whole point. So raging egomaniacs back then, still. Uh, well, uh, it, it worked. He pulled yeah, it off. Yeah, absolutely. So let's... Uh, we would have funded him. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And I say that without the benefit of hindsight. Okay. Um, so let's talk about a couple of things. There's so much to talk about with you two, but the first one is this north-south thing. I just, you know, it's north meets south. It's not north versus south anymore, because um, it's usually set up that way. Um, can you talk about the relationship right now between north and south, how you each look at it? Um, you've got, made a ton of content investments. Uh, you've made a ton of digital investments. How do you look at the relationship now? Bob, why don't you start? I don't really look at it as north versus south. I look at um, the, I look at content and technology, really, um, because I fundamentally believe, I mentioned to Mark uh, backstage, something that Walt Disney said, of all things, and he said that um, technology extends the purview of the storyteller. Mm -hmm. He was very, very interested in using technology to tell better stories and, and to have more people hear them or see them or whatever. And that's how I look at it. So we at Disney are fundamentally a storytelling or a content company. Um, and we also believe that technology is content's best friend in that it can be used, let's use Pixar as a great example, to simply make the stories more compelling for the, for the consumer. It can also be used to reach more people, which is really important. And it can be used to make the business more efficient, um, and to create a closer relationship with customers. So we never look, we don't look at, at north versus south in, in any um, combative way at all, um, nor do we look at technology as a threat, we look at it as an opportunity. And it's just something that I felt was really important when I became CEO 10 years ago, and it's something that is, I think, at this point, really part of the Disney culture. So you were one of the few executives who did this. We interviewed you at an early All Things Digital conference, and I think you said if someone's going to eat our lunch, it might as well be us, or something like that about technology. But most of the relationship had been stressful um, if, in general with Hollywood. I think, look, if you're in a somewhat traditional business and um, disruption is going on, that's clearly the case today, and it's been going on for the decade that I've been in the job, there's, there's, you have no real ability to ward it off or to avoid it in, in, except by embracing it in some form and using it for the good or your own good. And so I just really believe that um, when it comes to changes that technology is bringing in our businesses and, or in storytelling, for instance, bring it in bring, and, and use it to your advantage. It's that simple. So you, let me, Mark, how do you look at the relationship now? Because you've been making tons and tons of, I, I wouldn't say entertainment investments, but they're certainly comp in BuzzFeed and a bunch yeah. of, uh, in uh, Business Insider, a bunch of others. It's uh, largely in the news space, I guess. But how do you look at that right now? Yeah, so uh, it's a really exciting time. So uh, my view on it is from the time we started with the consumer internet in 93, 94, up until about three years ago, you'd have these really kind of discordant conversations. Uh, so you, you, all my friends, all my friends in LA would say, you know, sooner or later the tech guys are going to realize the content matters, and they're going to have to start, you know, paying for paying for content. And then all the tech guys would say, that's ridiculous, that's never going to happen. Like we, the whole point is, you don't have to pay for content. Users make all the content. Um, and starting about three years ago, and of course Netflix is, you know, has been a huge catalyst among among others on this. Starting three years ago, the number of buyers of content out coming out of the tech industry has just mm -hmm. been up and to the right. And so for, for studio, and I'm sure, sure Bob experiences this, for studios that make incredible content, it's, it's an amazing time because just the, the number of buyers is, is just exploding. And it's almost like every week or two that goes by now, another tech company decides to start, to start finding professional content. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what this Which represents- Is competitive or- No, 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 I think it represents gigantic market expansion. So, so I think the two universal truths are, um, whenever there's a new distribution technology, there's always a panic. Um, um, that it's going to hurt the content industry. Um, and then the other universal truth is that it never does. It always ends up increasing the size of, of the industry. And so and you, you see this over and over again. It happened with television, where the movie studios freaked out. It happened with the VCR. It's just, it's, it happened with the player piano 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. there, there was a whole freak out over the player yeah. piano because it was going to put all the musicians out of business. Were you there then with that fantastic beard? Yeah, yeah, that was back when Henry, Henry, Henry yeah. and I were hanging out making Model Ts. Yeah. Um, and so, um, and so there's, there's always this panic, but what ends up happening is the, the, the market size 
expands. And so I, I, the way we think about it is you have now a world of 3 billion people on smartphones and smart devices going to 5 billion. They're all going to be consumers of content. Um, part of what the Valley now does is actually buys content, and then a big part of what we do is we, we create new platforms, and now increasingly also we're creating new companies that actually create original content, and BuzzFeed is our, is our big investment in that space. And why did you go into a BuzzFeed? Yeah, so BuzzFeed for us is what, we've been waiting for BuzzFeed for a long time. It, it's, it's a combination of world-class content creation with world-class technology platform in the same company, right? And so um, a lot of the other content startups uh, in the last 20 years, many of them have been very successful. Uh, they've been content companies without being tech companies, or they've been tech companies that don't want to make content. And what, what Jonah Peretti's done at BuzzFeed is he's really brought those two worlds together, and he's built an authentic culture that, that sort of cross-pollinates between, between those two sides. And, it, and the results, I think, speak for themselves. It's exploding, both in terms of, of, of all of its metrics, and, and then its, its business is on fire. It's doing incredibly well. So, Bob, you had looked at buying BuzzFeed, is that correct? Yes. And didn't happen. You ended up buying Maker. Um, how do you look at those businesses? Totally different business. Yeah, but. absolutely. So why did you look at BuzzFeed? What were you thinking? What was the... What was the... Really impressed with um, how they um, made and distributed and in a way using technology marketed short form content mm -hmm. just brilliantly. And Jonah is, Jonah Peretti, who Mark mentioned, I think is you know, one of the best in the business, best that we've seen at using technology to move new forms of content very, very effectively into the marketplace of the consumers. We liked it. We also liked being able to use it for some of our businesses, but it didn't work out. What happened? Maker, uh, getting, into, I don't, getting into the details, it's, it's, we're not buying it. Okay, all right. <laughs> my, much of my knowledge is not for sale, and it wasn't contentious, it just didn't work out. Uh, Maker was different, but Maker served a real purpose for us in that they were much better at uh, producing content co or short form or, or causing short form content to be produced, distributing it and selling it or advertise, get, bringing mm -hmm. advertising revenue in. And we felt that we were much better at long form content mm -hmm. distribution and selling that and lack the expertise uh, for short form, which was growing tr dramatically. So we thought buying them would, be real, would really jumpstart us into a business that we weren't in deep enough. And the numbers, their makers numbers these days are 12 some odd billion views a month of content that, that Maker distributes. And 60,000 makers or contributors to their ecosystem. 60,000 different creators of short form content. And just another, I just saw the statistic, 10,000 applicants a week to Maker for them to facilitate the distribution of short form content of which they're choosing 100 out of the 10,000. How does it fit into Disney? Has it fit? There's been some discussion of the difficulty of integrating it, of having it part of the digital culture. It's fit into Disney well because they suddenly have access to some of our IP that they would not have had access to before. We have access to their platform and to the expertise that I just described. Just look at what we did on Force Friday, which was that Friday that we introduced all the Star Wars merchandise to the world. Mm -hmm. They had had channels and makers that were unboxers that just had basically programming or product that was about unboxing new toys. Yeah. And we use those platforms to unbox Star Wars merchandise worldwide, which is, I think, a perfect example of using their platform with our IP. And there'll be many more examples of that. They'll be very heavily involved in marketing the Star Wars film that's coming mm -hmm. up, for instance. So I've heard about that movie. Um, so you, when you uh, <laughs> think about that, do you think about buying more? Is that what your strategy is? Or do you think you can make, it at Dis make these things at, happen at Disney? Both. Some things we have the ability to make, meaning we have the technology expertise to, to uh, create ourselves and some things we don't. We're, we, we like to be really realistic about it. Sometimes it comes down to time, which is how long will it take us? We, when we looked at BuzzFeed, we estimated it would take us five years to get where BuzzFeed was with that kind of product. If you could even get there. If we could do it, yes. Right. It would have meant hiring the right engineers and basically the right talent. And I thought, well, five years was too long. Sure. Let's try to buy it. And as I said, we, we didn't. But. Sure. So let's talk about that uh, operating as a public versus private company. Mark and I just did a podcast, an extra long podcast, where we talked about the idea of private versus public valuations. 
um, and, and how easy it was to be a private company, and why would you be a private company anymore? Public. Um, public company, excuse me, a public company. You just recently had an experience with Wall Street where you were actually honest about things, um, and it caused quite a hubbub in terms of talking about ESPN and other things, and it caused a lot of the media stocks, the public media stocks to decline. Talk a little bit about why you did that and what you think, you'd, you, you told me outside you'd say the same thing again. Talk about why you did that and what you think happened. Well, I've tried really hard uh, whenever I am um, public in, in, from an investor perspective, um, which typically is on earnings calls, but I do conferences in between, to be as candid as possible. I don't, not, that doesn't mean we say everything that we, that's going on or tell them everything, but uh, when it comes down to important things or trends or things that are going to be meaningful to our business, either positively or negatively, I try to be very upfront about it. I found, by the way, when I give, when I talk about things that are potentially negative, mm -hmm. um, uh, it, there's a, it gives me, a, I, I earn a lot of credibility so that when I'm out there selling, which I don't do that much, but when I talk about things I'm very excited about, I have a lot of credibility there too. So it makes me a more effective salesman, in mm -hmm. effect. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the hard thing, I, I think, in terms of, I've never been part of a private company of 41 years mm -hmm. at ABC and Disney. We have openings. <laughs> I'm ready. I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be out on the street in a few years. Okay. Um, and it's a little different than being candid, is that there is this ridiculous vortex that exists for public companies to, um, well, first quarterly earnings, mm -hmm. to meet analysts' estimates, which is just ridiculous. I mean, there's an absurdity to the whole thing. Nothing against analysts, but you can't manage a company to, in order, in, in, in effect, you can't you, you can't manage a company just because of what analysts expect you to do. Um, it's just not the way things work. Uh, and you know, heaven forbid you you miss a quarter, as they mm -hmm. say, or miss estimates. Right. It's someone else's estimates. And the other thing that's a big problem is guidance. Companies get in this ridiculous vortex of guidance where they put out there either what they expect to earn or elements of what will deliver certain earnings. So you're like in sales the vortex numbers. situation. It's awful. It sounds like a it's Star awful. Trek. So you can't, and so I've tried really hard not to manage the company. We have to give quarterly earnings. Um, but I try not to manage the company with that in mind because you, you can't possibly manage a company right, in my opinion, if all you're thinking about is quarterly earnings. And I think there's a way to do it um, and, and succeed. And it also ties to being able to make investments, mm -hmm. which sometimes can suppress near-term or quarterly earnings, but deliver a long-term value. And what you have to do is you have to be re really transparent, uh, you have to be consistent, and when you make investments or when you uh, implement certain strategies, they have to sync up with do, what your public you positioning has been strategically. Is so, it then unfair then, under the, that the idea that you could, that you have to pay these enormous valuations for these digital companies if you want to buy them? I don't, I, I, you know, it's a way of the world, then I'll look at it as fair or unfair. So, Mark, talk about p private valuations, which yeah. you, you talked about the dichotomy between that. Yeah. Well, so the, the effect sort of from a financial market standpoint, I, my view is you have to look at public and private companies as a, as a set. Uh, uh, people t like to look at them sort of separately, and I think you need to look at them together. And I think the, the thing that has really happened, the result of everything that Bob described, um, is that public companies as a group in the U.S. are under intense pressure from their investors to give money back as opposed to invest, invest in new efforts. Um, and by the way, I think this explains a lot of what's going on in the economy, including, by the way, a big reason for low interest rates as well as you know, relatively slow job growth is because the big public companies are having a hard time investing. As a consequence, this year for the first time, over a trillion dollars of cash will come out of public companies. In the, just the top 500 companies in the U.S., a trillion dollars in cash Paid back to in the form of buybacks and dividends will come back to shareholders. And then shareholders get the trillion dollars in cash and they have to decide where to put it. Um, it, and then you go to the, to, the, to the private side. So what happens is about $50 billion of that this year will flow into private companies, right? right? And about $950 billion won't. And by the way, a lot of that goes into bonds and therefore low interest rates, or a, a, one of the reasons for low interest rates. Um, and so in that context, it, it, it's, I think it's very hard to argue for a bubble on the private side. I think it's much easier to argue um, that it's a reallocation of capital from the public side to the private side. And it's basically shareholders saying we want public companies to give back money and we want private companies to grow. 
the kicker is that it's often the same investors. It's mm -hmm. the same mutual funds and the same hedge funds that are pulling money out of the public side, putting it into the private side. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the big thing that's actually happening. And, uh, and by the way, like I, uh, what I don't know is, is this a permanent change or is this just a, is this, is just a, is this cyclical? Is this a reaction to the crashes of 2000 and 2008 and we're just at a point where the pendulum has swung all the way over here and it'll swing back? Or is this a permanent change in the market? Um, in which case, this is just how the world. Well, you wouldn't work. want to go ahead. Sorry. Well, the other thing that the other dynamic that creates is risk aversion. If you're a CEO of a large public company, which you that are. is constantly under scrutiny, <laughs> um, meaning because you're so big and so well known, then making a big acquisition or even a big strategic investment is not the easiest thing in the world because it's a it's a tough world out there, and there's a synergy with the business press. Nothing against the business press, but you can't do anything that is not um, in, a, in a large fishbowl, really actually high definition fishbowl mm -hmm. in effect. And so I think, and I, I don't wanna uh, be critical of all CEO, CEOs of public companies, but I think what I've observed is a lot of CEOs don't have the guts to be ambitious. And if you're not ambitious in some form, and I mean ambitious, I mean, think big ideas and not just think about them but have the guts ultimately to, to try them to implement them whether you're making an acquisition or whether again whether it's an organic investment you know you just you stay you, you avoid that it's just easier it's a path of least resistance so would you because like if you make a mistake you know this is so totally unforgiving right would you like to be a private company I'm, you know, I'm fine <laughs> where we are yeah. with Disney we're doing just fine we've returned a lot of value to shareholders over the years in the form of buybacks and, um, and growth uh, and dividends. And so we're, we're absolutely fine. Now, are there times when, um, you know, when you're at this, in this job for 10 years and you have to face another earnings call and your head of investor relations reminds you that they expect, I don't know, X amount in revenue, and I end up saying, who cares what they expect in revenue? Yeah. We could buy revenue, by the way, by just tripling our marketing budget and bring a lot more revenue in. It would hurt the bottom line. You know, why do we care? But it can be annoying. The dynamic can be annoying. Do you find um, the, when you're in these private companies, the valuations are much higher, too, and, but they also have all this cash that you've stolen from Bob, apparently, apparently. Um, and brought to Mark Andreessen. It seems like lots of money flows to Mark Andreessen. Um, how do you, you, you then put it into these companies at these enormous valuations, the Ubers, the, you aren't in Uber, you're in Lyft, yeah. um, but all these other companies that, that do that, do you think that does create a bubble situation when you steal his money and give it to them? Well, I think what happens, uh, avoiding all the loaded terms in the question, um, I, think, I, I think the way to think about it is on a time horizon standpoint. Yeah. And so I think this is part of what, so, so kind of as Bob described, public companies live on a quarterly time horizon. Um, private companies today, for better or for worse, private companies are able to think, are able to live on over multiple years. And again, the, the irony is it's the exact same investors who are saying uh, public companies should live quarterly who are saying, uh, you know, the late stage rounds, they're, you know, we're in earlier, the, the, these other investors come in later and they say to our CEOs, they say, you know, work over the, you know, think over the course of the next five or 10 years. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really positive thing. I think it's a really good thing to have companies in the American economy that are able to make long-term investments in new areas. I think it's one of the things that makes the economy great and vibrant and creates growth. Um, it's just incredibly striking how, how much time the private companies are being given and the time horizon that people are willing to calculate from a valuation standpoint mm -hmm. uh, versus the amount of time the, the public companies are given. So let's talk a little bit about, let's move from public companies to this idea of where uh, content is going. Now, actually, I want to get to the verse before that. When you made that, this is a good segue into it, is when you were talking about ESPN and the troubles in cable, that was one of your great drivers at Disney has been ESPN and some of your other investments in that area. Um, are you worried about the television business right no. now or the cable business? No. Well, I'm Would not worried about the television business. Or the cable business. I think in television today, you have to get three things right. You have to make something really good. I'll tie brand to that a little bit because brand value can be very meaningful too. Uh, you have to have great navigation and user interface. It has to be findable and really usable. And you have to have mobility. Those three things. And if you don't have, if you have great content and you have great navigation, or you're, you're findable and you have mobility, you're going to be fine. Unless you're Shonda Rhimes, and then it doesn't really matter what people watch it on. Correct? <laughs> well, it, it does matter. Um, so if you look at cable today, 
most of the cable companies are stuck in legacy, with legacy technology that does not give them the ability to offer their customers mobility. They can, but that's, it's clunky. Um, and navigation and user interface is a big problem, a big problem. And I think one of the things we're seeing today is a growth in, I'll call it off cable or off fixed television viewing or consumption because what's being offered on the new platforms, whether it's traditional content or BuzzFeed, for instance, mm -hmm. it's just more com can be more compelling. So I don't, if, I don't really worry about the TV business in the sense that if we continue to make great content and we figure out how to put it on platforms that offer the consumer a much better experience, and particularly mobile, we're going to be fine. I noticed, I just saw numbers for last night's Monday Night Football game on ESPN, and the number of people that are watching Monday Night Football on their watch app on a mobile device has doubled in a year, and it's big, and it's contributing big time to the consumer numbers. Now, we're getting measurements of them, but they're not being included in Nielsen's numbers, so they're not being turned into money yet, but that will happen. Mm -hmm. But it's tr there's tremendous growth there. So uh, if you're, in our case, if you're Disney and you're in the Pixar business or the Disney business, the ABC business, the Star Wars business, the Marvel business, again, as long as you're, you're willing to um, move your content in more um, uh, modern ways or to more, to more current so platforms, is, you're going to be fine. Is ABC a network? And is, do you need a network? ABC is more, more than a network, it's a content creator. What, what, I, what I think about often about ABC, because we own a lot of the shows that are made there, including the shows that Shonda Rhimes makes, for instance, they're produced under our aegis. She's obviously, a, we're, we're a partner of hers and vice versa. Um, what I think about a lot as it relates to ABC and what's a little odd to me today is ABC is being programmed the same way as being programmed when I ran it in the 80s. Yeah. And when it was created in the 50s, meaning there are 22 hours of primetime programming and there's news that happens here and this happens there. And that seems a little artificial in today's world. And what ABC is looking at is what does their network look like in the future? Is there, what happens to linear TV, for instance, and what platforms are their programs on and how do people get them? Do you think there really is linear TV anymore? I mean, I, I, I find it hard. I mean, I have children. And I think watch when, when it comes to cable and when it comes to linear TV, oh, look, I don't think you're going to see revolution, but you're going to see continued evolution in terms of how people are consuming television, whether it's linear, whether it's view, view, via apps, whether it's on mobile devices. And that goes all the way back. To what I said on the earnings call was that we were seeing some erosion in terms of total subscribers right. to ESPN. It was right. basically that simple. Yeah, except it's set and off. Why do you think it's set off such a... Well, in our case, it's set off a frenzy because ESPN is one of our most profitable businesses. Right. And in fact, our media network. But it through, iterated throughout the whole. It did, because I, I, I think I was actually saying what everybody knows, but no one was, had said. Right. And that is that, that the number of people that subscribe to the big bundle multi-channel multi -channel television has decreased over the recent past. Some of that is economic in nature, that the cost of it, given what's going on in the economy, got to the point where it was, didn't have the price value relationship that it needed. Some of it is because there's so much alternative forms of media out there today, whether it's Netflix or BuzzFeed or whatever. Mm -hmm. So there's just more, there's more competition. Um, and it's just, I think it's, and it's the way of the world. We're seeing change. It's tangible change. Will there be packages of channels? Yes. Will the big bundle of 100 some odd channels continue to be the number one way that people get television? I'm not 100% sure, but there'll be packages and we'll, our product will be in most of them. But it could yes. be the Star Wars package that not the- Well, that's different. I think there's a whole other world coming in that, and I know that, um, that Tim Cook, when they announced Apple TV, talked about an app world or an, a television will become kind of an app-centric world. I happen to believe that that is the case, but it'll take more time. But we're working hard at developing apps for these brands. Think of an ESP, there's an ESPN app already, right. and it offers some form of video, but think of it down the road as something that includes their so-called linear channels, a little different with ESPN because of live sports, uh, as well as all the other bells and whistles that come with ESPN. Actually, from a consumer perspective, it's much more compelling because it's much more dimensionalized. It has many more features yeah. than just sitting watching 
a program on, on one box or right. one, one, one well, monitor. How do you look at the modern network? I can't, I, 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 to me, I don't think there will be one. I don't think children watch them that way. I watch my, how my kids watch them. They watch it in pieces. They'll watch it vines. They'll watch everything as entertainment to them, and it's all on a device. It's almost it's very little on television except when they throw it up there. Yeah, so I think, uh, let me say one uncontroversial thing and then one controversial thing. Right. So the uncontroversial thing, I think you can see the future, and I'd frankly... You're, so you're private, so you can say I controversial can say, things. <laughs> oh, I can say anything. I'm public. No, and then they think he's a genius when he does it. You're just, right. His you're just, multiple will go you're up. You're just the asshole who dropped the stock, so anyway. My, my, my pain is yours. It's the, the first time I've ever been called that in, <laughs> really? on, on I'm sorry. a public panel. Really? And you're a Disney consumer. I am not a Disney consumer. I am a forced <laughs> March it. Disney. I went on a Disney cruise and I wrote him and I was like, I can't believe I gave you all this money. Um, but <laughs> I can. But my, it was, I got to say, <laughs> I got to say, my kids now, I was just with my kids and they were like, we want to go on another Disney cruise. And I literally, a part of me died inside. It was just, <laughs> but I'm going to go, I guess. No, it was a fantastic, I have to say, Disney should run the government. Like, you should, like, <laughs> Forget Trump. It should be like Mickey Mouse running the government. Um, I agree with that. Yeah, I'm not you know going I mean? there. Like, and then it would be, and then it would be like free uh, soft serve all the time. Like, I think that was the best. <laughs> we part. interrupted Mark. What, what were you saying? <laughs> what do you, what, what do were you, you saying? What do you think about free soft serve all the time? I'm happy. I'm, ha I'm just. I'm just happy to sit here. Um, so. Um, so let me say something I know Bob will agree with and then something that he, he may or may not agree with. So um, I think you can see the future, and I think, frankly, I think it's the deal that you guys have with Netflix on the Marvel shows. Um, and I think... talking to Ted Sarandos. For those of you who have not seen Daredevil, like, it is absolutely spectacular. And then there's this, the second show's coming out called Jessica Jones that you guys have only permitted the 45 I've seen a couple of them. Have you seen? Yeah. Yes. And, like, it looks... Abs I don't know, if it's anywhere as good as Daredevil, it's going to be... Spectacular, and so like what you know, what like what you know, it's, it's long form, it's long form video, it's a TV show, but it's right there on demand. All the right. all the shows come out the same day. It's spectacular, and I assume that's a good business for you guys because you're doing it, and it, everybody seems seems very happy. So, you know, we're in a golden age. Uh, it, I think there's no question like we're in a golden age for, for for television, and there's a creative renaissance happening that's unprecedented as a result of the technology and the economics that are unfolding. The radical thing is, I think my analysis is in the long run, not in the short run, but in the long run, when the bundle ultimately goes, I think that actually both the cable companies and the content companies are going to end up making more money. Um, and I think the reason for that is that the content companies are going to end up being able to go direct to the consumer. Mm -hmm. And so I think ESPN, you know, 10 years from now can have many more uh, viewers or subscribers than it has today, especially in the globalized world where so many more people internationally are going to have access to, it's just to, the to format. video. That's not controversial in my mind. Yeah. Okay, good, good. And then I also, uh, it, I, go ahead. What's no. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I also think that uh, I also think the cable companies will end up making more money because right now the cable companies write giant checks for content, mm -hmm. and when they're not writing the giant checks for content and they're selling broadband, um, I think they'll actually also be more profitable. Mm -hmm. And so again, this is a, a thing where I think there's a lot of right now there's a lot of concern because there's an established kind of way of doing business, but in the long run, I think both of these are going to do really would well. Would you Would you ever start to invest in studios? Do you see Do you see an Apple buying? Disney, for example, or something like that. You, you know, have to answer you that. asked him that. You're question. kind of messed up in that one. I was going to say screwed because you're on the Apple board and running Disney. But um, what? How do you, do you ever see that happening? Or Google buying Time Warner? Or it's almost happened multiple times. Right. I mean, not to name names, but like there well, have name been names. there have been deals. Right. I mean, there, well, I mean, AOL Time Warner is certainly yes. you know the one that happened. But that, that worked out. That so was well. a good one. Yeah, yeah. There were, there were, there were, you know. <laughs> I got a whole book out of that one. Yeah, did you? So, you, you, yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You, tell, you tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So, um, but you know, there there were others. Um, you know, uh, it's actually an excellent point. Is that you know that 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 has been a cautionary lesson more than, more than anything else. You know, I don't know. I think that's a really, really interesting question. I, I, I mean, the fact that we are investing in companies like BuzzFeed does point to a future in which I think right. the tech industry will get more directly involved in content creation. The fact that Netflix is now making its own content, its own original content itself. And in Amazon. And uh, well, and they're buying. They're, well, they're buying. They're, 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 yes. They're, also, they're buying a lot, but they're also talking about starting to make, you know, starting to produce their own. Yeah, um, yeah but, they're buying, but they're, they're entering into deals with creators that make the content. Right. Exactly. The which same is, deals, the same like, creators that we would turn to. Right, exactly. Right. So, they so there's, take, they're moving into your business, in other words. Yes, they're both, yeah, they're, they're both competitor buying. and uh, facilitator. Or they're, right. or so it's, you, you, things are vectoring in that direction. Um, you know, I, I, we'll, uh, just as ourselves, we'll take it on a case-by-case -case basis. And so if another Jonah Pretty walks in, the, you know, if, if you know, Jonah version 2 walks in the room and has a great idea. In a video we would, sense. We would certainly, yeah. yeah well, and actually BuzzFeed has a huge push underway in video. Right, they um, do. And so that, it's actually a good example of that today. Well, but what Mark said about being able to take your product direct to consumer is something that we think about a lot, and I think it's incredibly exciting. 
But that's when you're, the decisions that you make about what content you make become really critical. Right. Because you can't launch an app that just says Acme TV on it or whatever, right. you know. Or that's where I, when I talked about brand value. If you put ESPN out there or Marvel out there, or imagine, I know he's a big Star Wars fan, a Star Wars app, right. and in that you've got Star Wars related TV, the films that have been made, all of the material that has been generated over the years that is more background in nature or short form in nature, as well as then you add to it games and books and the like, um, that becomes a very interesting consumer proposition, very sellable in my mind, and certainly very usable in terms of these new platforms. So we, we were going to talk a little about China, but actually we have just a short amount of time. Star Wars uh, coming out. Mm -hmm. December 18th. Okay. Uh, I'm sure I'll be for Thursday. Now. It'll be Thursday at midnight, probably, yeah. or, or, may, or maybe 7 o'clock at night. We may bring it out on Thursday the 17th. Are we going together if you're telling me these exact <laughs> times? <laughs> I'm in. Oh, my God. Yes. You've already shown a few little nerdy things here that are. I'm in. Okay. I'm all in. All right. You're going to be dressed up? I'll be there. Boba Fett. Okay. Wow. <laughs> no question. I was hoping for the Carrie Fisher outfit. <laughs> it's also, also a possibility. Yeah. Oh, no, no. Please. Well, all right, yes. Man buns. Yes, okay, You're great. doing a good job. I don't have to say anything. I don't have to real, reveal <laughs> anything about the film. I'm we've listening, known, though. It's we've fun. We've known each other for far too long. Um, talk about the, the, the from then to now. Wow, this like, how long has it been? The first Last film was 2005. Right, so, and then way back. From the, this is now the... 1977. Sixth one. Seven. So what position? This will be the seventh. The seventh. So now we're moving forward for the last three. Um, do you, how, how do you looking at this as different? from when it first started, because it did change movie making at the time. Well, you have to begin by, and I saw George here earlier, but by giving George both praise and credit for creating what I've said is probably the most valuable, successful mythology of the 20th century. Um, the, the brilliance of it, the fact that it all came from George's mind uh, is, and the fact that it is as successful as it is today when a film has not been released in 10 years says a lot about what George created. So we start with um, a very, very profound respect and appreciation for not only what was created, but for the, but the responsibility that we have to reintroduce it to the marketplace in a way that honors its tradition. But we also know, and George would be the first to say this, that nothing is static, nothing stays still. Right. And in this case, the storytelling moves forward too. The saga that was Star Wars doesn't, it isn't stuck in time. So we pick it up from where George left off after his third movie. Right. Um, and because there were three that came yeah. thereafter that were the prequels. Out. And so the story picks up there. Yeah with Carrie Fisher and Mark Hamill and um, Harrison Ford in it mm -hmm. some 30, 35 years after we last saw them. Um, and so there's, a, there's a, I think, a very, very smooth, effective, satisfying um, transition from then to the last time we saw them as those characters to this film. And, is it and yet we bring it forward by introducing a new generation right. of, 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 of characters, not all humans, um, and that will take the storytelling hopefully well into the future. But our plans right now were J.J. Abrams, who is here tomorrow, has made Star Wars 7, The Force Awakens. He's finishing it. He's scoring it this week. Star Wars 8 uh, is in the early stages of shooting. That comes out in May of 17. And we have a director for Star Wars 9, which will be May of 19. Then in between those films, there'll be two standalone films. One is called Rogue One, which is a story that's sort of a standalone story that uh, takes place just before what was the first film, New Hope. So before we first were introduced. In terms of what's different, or because George broke so much new ground, uh, clearly technology will, has enabled us to bring this thing forward you know, a few generations at this point. So uh, while the look will be very traditional Star Wars, obviously what technology has allowed J.J. to do in terms of telling the story is, you know, it more advanced. But he also made the decision to honor what George did, which is even though he really invented modern uh, 3D uh, special or, or CG special effects, um, he also, George, shot a lot of practical 
sets and, um, and locations, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. And JJ has done that in this film. So while it's got great technology, it also has the scope that you can only really get when you shoot in sort of real life on a desert. Right. Or the Millennium Falcon, which Annie Leibovitz mentioned she shot and it was in Vanity Fair, was built, actually. Now, when it flies, it's computer-generated. Wow, I didn't know we that. We couldn't do that. Not yet. Um, I'm sorry to <laughs> we'll say, but it's got to be a good movie. Is it a good movie? <laughs> I mean, and Mark just wants to know if there's, the lightsabers are cool. That's great. The lightsabers are cool. Yeah. I'm, look, I, I'm very excited about the film. I've seen it a few times. I can't wait to share it with the world, and it's not that far off and I'm not going to say anything more. All right, then. All right. So let's have questions from the audience. Bring it up. Hi, good afternoon. So Disney's a company that does so many different things. They've got the amusement parks. They've got a movie production company. They've got television properties like ESPN. They have a cruise. Uh, you're the CEO of one company that does so many things. Is there a particular part of Disney that you think your real strength is, that your leadership is most focused or you're best suited to leading that part of Disney? And have you considered like any circumstances under which certain parts of Disney, which are so different than one another, you would spin off so they could be their own standalone companies? So one of the things he didn't talk about was parks, which the new Shanghai facility is opening mm -hmm. when? Spring of 16, Spring. yeah. On this, the second part of your question, you know, we, we always look at our asset base with an eye toward um, you know, making sure that, that we have enough assets to deliver the kind of value that we believe our shareholders would expect. Um, there isn't anything right now that we're really thinking about spinning off, but we wouldn't be able to say that publicly anyway if there, if there were one. Um, Frankly, the pieces mostly fit together quite well. Uh, part, you, while movies and parks, you're not, and maybe it doesn't, feels like completely different business or TV, but we're using intellectual property that's created in these films in the physical space that is our parks, for instance. We just announced we're building two Star Wars lands, for instance. Um, so we think actually the collection of assets actually works fairly well. In terms of my expertise, you know, I'm, a, I'm sort of a band leader, an orchestra conductor of all these really incredible assets. There are talented people either managing each of these assets or creating for all of these assets that do a fine job. And I try to use my time to create some direction for the company overall. CEOs, I think, have a responsibility to create a strategy for a company, as a, for instance, and to set ethical standards um, and hopefully to lead by example. Um, but I, and I, I try to use my time where I think I can add value, and I, it, it's a variety of different places. I also try to spend time on things that are incredibly important to the company, where I feel I've got a sense of responsibility to commit time because of the importance of the project long term. So Kara mentioned Shanghai Disneyland, which we're going to open in 2016. I've spent a lot of time on that because it has the potential the potential to create so much long-term value for the company uh, and the investment is the, it's the biggest foreign investment we've ever made. It's a, we're building a park that is um, in excess of $5.5 billion. And so as a CEO of the company, I feel it's my responsibility to make sure that it's being done right and to work with the people that are really creating it closely. It also happens to be fun. <laughs> I will I'd say when you get in, when you're in a job 10 years, you have the ability to pick your spots every once in a while. And for instance, it's much more fun working on Shanghai Disneyland than having a meeting on benefits. Or, what? Or something like that. Benefits are important. But. Yeah, they tell me I have to wrap up, but, um, so we can't ask any more questions. But thank you very much, and thank you guys. Good, thank good. You. Thanks, everybody.